Hey team, it's Syra, and this week we are having a conversation with someone who is extremely important to my personal and professional development, and someone that I hope will eventually get integrated into your life after you hear this interview. Her name is Dr. Julie Gerner. She is an executive coach here in the United States, and I don't know that I have words. We we talk about imposter syndrome. We talk about what it's like to have certain conversations in the office that are uncomfortable. And we talk about pivotal moments as a professional in the workplace. So without further ado, I think we should just jump right into the episode. So join me. Let's effing go. (laughs) Hey, Tim, we're back. Did you miss us? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh what an oh, intro what an intro always an intro meg are you you're in indiana right i sure am i am on the lovely lake michigan which yes is the inland ocean mm-hmm. uh staying with my parents for a month it's been glorious you look like you're in vacation mode but you're still working every day right like i'm not pulling you completely out of vacation Oh, absolutely not. I'm working this entire time. This is my makeshift desk. I wish I could show you. Um, I pulled this <laughs> lamp behind me so it didn't look like baby in a corner. Um, <laughs> but I'm in my parents' den on their TV stand. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, my gosh. I'll take a photo. We should post it. I think that would be kind of funny, actually. <sighs> so big interview today. Yes. Season two interviews. Season two. I, yes. And, and I think... For me, I've been carrying this big weight around because we restructured a little bit. We're reformatting exactly how we're planning on chatting with people. And for me, I'm extremely nervous about this particular interview because it is quite literally a woman that has influenced a significant amount of, I guess, my my being, my soul, my leadership style and who I am. So she is someone that knows some of my deepest, darkest secrets. And her name is Dr. Julie Gerner. Mm. Uh, like, are, are you ready to kind of peek behind the curtain and figure out exactly, I don't know, how weird people can be? I love it. I think you and I talk about personal improvement constantly, which is maybe a little obsessive. Um, but I think <laughs> most women do and men absolutely do as well. Um, and I think it's so amazingly vulnerable and authentic of you to be able to present someone that you helped be vulnerable with to put you on a pedestal in the right direction of where you wanted to go. Because, I mean, you you wanted to see her because you were like, I want to improve this, this and that. Right. Yeah, for sure. That's that's 100 percent the case. Uh, she and I have since evolved and, and definitely become friends. I mean, maybe she'll tell you different. I don't know. Maybe she hates me after all of our coaching <laughs> sessions. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. But I was honestly I was going through such a transitory period. I had such a toxic work culture prior to joining HM Bradley. And she helped me not only shift my mindset, but also learn to develop my voice both as a human and as a leader in our community. And and I say community as in like, not only our friend circle, but also the greater world, not, and not just like Twitter spheres and online, just generally, I feel like I have developed and designed a voice that sounds so much more like who I am and the person, the person that I should have been a while ago, but needed a little bit more coaching to, to arrive to. And it takes us all a moment to get there. I mean, both of us are in our 30s. I feel like you and I ran around flailing our hands in our 20s trying to figure out, you know, which way was up or down. Um, And you're just like, I think everyone kind of hits a point. And they're like, I can't do this alone. And I need help. And that's such an amazing thing to be able to say. And I've gotten help myself from so many people, um, you know, career coaches or life coaches or what have you. Um, and so I'm excited to to pick Dr. Gerner's brain a little bit to hear a little bit from her perspective and see if I can get any nuggets myself. Yeah, I think I think most people today, especially after the extremely taxing last year that we've undergone, need a little nudge here or there and need a little coaching to have certain conversations and to path out exactly where they want to be, whether it's at work or at home or as a leader within their communities. So yeah, I'm so excited to talk to Dr. G. 
I mean, should we jump in? Yeah, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's dive into this interview. It's time. Hello, everyone. I am sitting here with the wonderful Dr. Julie Gerner and my co-host Megan McShane. Hello, everyone. How are we doing this afternoon? I'm great. I'm so excited for this, Dr. Yeah. Gerner. Cyrus says nothing but amazing things about you. <laughs> That's such a compliment. She really has. And I, she's taken so many tidbits from you. So I'm so excited to talk to, with you today, not only to get some nuggets myself on how I should be thinking about my life and work life and balance, <laughs> but also for, for our listeners um, who are really striving to do all of those things. So welcome. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It is just, um, it's been wonderful just kind of following you all on Twitter and seeing what you're doing. And the podcast is really phenomenal. Thank you. That's a huge compliment coming from someone like you as well. Um, so we like to kick it off. We believe that everyone we have on the podcast is a hero in their own regard. Um, and so really, we would love to hear from you a little bit of your hero's journey to get to where you are like in your career um, and just kind of some tidbits along the way. We'd love to hear that and just kind of kick it off. Sure. Um, I'll give you the condensed version. You know, I started off very traditionally in psychology and it was really uh, kind of early on thought I would go into a very traditional uh, kind of job and work at, at a variety of places. So I worked in, you know, hospitals and prisons. I've worked in a number of different settings and it's been, you know, it was really fulfilling. I decided that I wanted to transition, do some work in academics, and then I started to get tapped for advising on products and tech. And that's really where my journey begins, is that I was tapped to advise on things like cognitive load and with some of these other things. And one of the, you know, those who are funding, you know, I guess I would say a venture firm that was funding this particular startup that I was working with. They said, you know, we have this founder in our portfolio. They're really struggling. Uh, they had just gotten, you know, a great round and, and now they can't make decisions. They're struggling to make decisions. And, you know, formerly a really effective person. They're like, oh, would you mind just chatting with them, seeing what's what's happening there? And so me and this founder, you know, I'd never done this kind of work before. And I, I chatted with this founder. And in a few weeks, this person is able to kind of get back on track and making decisions. And you know, to me, that was not such a big deal. But for the firm, they were like, this is amazing. We're going to set you on all of these other companies. You're going to work with all of these other founders. And I was like, but I have this job to do, you know. Um, but I began to see the value of what I could bring and helping people who, you know, weren't ill. They're not struggling with a particular illness, but they're people who are at these points in their lives where they have these barriers and these, these problems that can use just a bit of a tweak or adjustment and diving in with those, that kind of knowledge was really useful. And it changed the course of people's business. It changed the course of how they proceeded in their careers. And it was incredibly fulfilling. So within the year of that happening, I was like, I'm going to bring a few clients aboard. I'm going to see what happens. And then it just kind of caught fire from there. And I was so excited. I started working with larger scale uh, companies, a company that I worked with early on and was able to have uh, I flew out to their private retreat. They ended up selling for six hundred million dollars. Um, and you know, I began to kind of get a great reputation in my space, and I couldn't be happier because I think it's really when what you love to do marries a kind of with the skill set and need in the market. And I've been really fortunate to kind of own that space for a while now, and I've been doing this for about twelve or thirteen years. So it's been really phenomenal, and I couldn't be happier about it. Well, I, I just want to applaud you in, in in being, you know, coming such a long way and having that moment of being like, I can do this on my own. Um, and I really have something to bring to the table. And I know Syra and I discuss this all the time, right? I work for a Fortune 100 company. She works for an up and coming uh, neo bank, And we're both like, when's the right time? And we keep having having those moments. And so I really want to applaud you in that being a woman in this space and really dominating. I think that's just really cool to know someone like that. So thank you for being that for us. No, I think that, you know, everybody comes to a point in their career where they start to hit against walls and they look around. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen in your career where you look around and you go, oh, my God, I don't want to end up like 
this other person who's been here for 20 years or this other person who feels very stuck. Like there's no worse feeling in the world than feeling stuck or feeling like you have a ceiling where you can't progress. And I think that there are a lot of places, especially in traditional fields as like the one I come from, where if you're going to work at a hospital, if you're going to work in a, an academic institution, there are always ceilings, right, to where you can go. And even the highest ceiling is not particularly like exciting or attractive if it's not where your heart's at. Um, and so if it's where your heart is, you know, you run with it and it's amazing. But if you start feeling personally, like for myself, I have had the sense that like I could do more than where I was. And I didn't really know exactly where that was going to manifest at the time. And then when I was given the opportunity, I was like, wow, I can do the work I want to do at the caliber I want to do it, at being completely in charge of the quality of work and who I work with. I'm going to run with this. And I think that everybody really has those moments where they see what they can do and they see the opportunity. And I always hope that they take the leap. Like I'm rooting for them to take that leap. Dr. Gurner, I want to I want to ask you kind of a follow-up question and get your opinion here too. So Syra and I are in the business of content creation, whether we wanted to get here or not, here we are. Um, and you know, there's really been this surge, um, I think, in older generations, younger generations, of looking at the new marketplace and being like, how do I become a content creator, first of all? And second of all, you know, when do I make the switch and how do I know it's the right time? Um, and so you touched on your tipping point of I have these clients, I have these things. Um, how would you approach someone that was kind of facing that issue? Like what would be kind of the three things you'd be like, hey, this is what you need to focus on to see if this is actually viable. How would you approach that? I think the number one thing is, are you autodidactic? Are you willing to teach yourself? If you're not willing to teach yourself, if you're not willing to be a self-learner or self-starter, then content creation is not going to be for you because there are new platforms. There are, I mean, you all are self-producing and you've figured it out. Like you didn't go to professional school to learn this. I mean, you figured it out and it's amazing, right? Like you can still get out there and have your message out there. So I think, are you an autodidactic person? I think you have to get really honest about that. I think secondly, can you take doing a lot of work for very little payoff for a period of time? Do you have that kind of patience? Are you willing, do you believe enough that you're going to kind of have that commitment and continue to follow through? If that's true, okay, so you tick off the box, you're autodidactic, you're willing to do the work. You're willing to do it for a long time with very little payoff. That's number two. And I think the third one is, you know, when do you make that switch? I think you're willing to do it on the side until you begin to see payoff that makes a leap make sense. Like I'm a really practical person and I don't want someone saying, oh, you know, I'm going to live in poverty and I'm going to live on someone's sofa while I try to make this content. And while that sounds romantic, like that sounds terrible to me. And I don't think that I would want someone having to go through that. I think you could have a day job, build up your strength on the side and do these wonderful things and, and still see. And then once you, I think also, if I were to add one other thing is to know when to switch platforms. And I can be really honest about the fact that like early on, I tried to do some things on Twitch. I set up my own channel. I, I did a and a like, here, here's an office hour. Come and ask me anything. And you know what? It was the wrong audience, the wrong demographic, didn't show up. I did it for a year. Didn't work out. Switch platforms. That's fine. Um, so I think that you have to be willing to take a hit every now and again and say, well, this isn't working. I can see this. My momentum isn't on my side and, and be willing to make a shift and not take it personally. Yeah. And actually, the, Dr. G, what you were saying about, you know, living in poverty on someone's couch, that really resonated with me. Because I think for me, one of the biggest things, having come from a traditional finance background, building my nest egg, and then uh, kind of adding that additional layer of now I work for, uh, you know, a very, very rapidly accelerating company. Yeah. I... I feel like I'm taken care of in that regard. I, I'm compensated for the hard work that I contribute. So I, I'm curious, it sounds like what you were saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that we should feel financially stable and comfortable before we jump ship, meaning we should either have a nest egg or we should be generating enough income from what we're doing as content creators to be able to make that switch from are more stable jobs into something that's a little bit more lumpy and potentially uncertain as content creation. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's a great summary of 
how I feel in in the space because I think that if you you want to go full speed into the space, I know that it's exciting and people get really um, you know it, you want to give everything to it, but you have to be able to allocate your time properly so that you're able to have duration. Because without that, what's going to happen is you're going to be out there creating content, and doing your thing, and then you're going to be kind of getting low on funds. So you're not going to take the chances that you should. It's going to impact your decision making. It's going to impact some of the things you do. It'll impact the kind of software you buy. It'll impact the kind of advertisements or maybe marketing you do. So all of those things will end up holding you back a little bit. But if you do have that additional financing, you know, you can take more chances and that pays off all of the time. So that's kind of how I think about it. Beautiful. And that actually leads into my next question, which I have already kind of admitted to our listeners, but full disclosure, Dr. Gerner has done executive coaching with me 12 out of 10, by the way, anyone that's contemplating someone, you should absolutely reach out to her. She has transformed significantly who I am as a leader. That being said, one of the things that we always get asked about and something that I came to you about was imposter syndrome. And I'm curious if you could provide our listeners with two or three things, because I think a lot of people a lot of people face imposter syndrome. I know we talk about it mostly as it pertains to women, but I do think it's actually across the board the more and more I interact with people. And I, I guess I'm just curious if you could give people guidance on how to relieve themselves of some of their imposter syndrome, what would you tell them? I think, first of all, I just want to thank you for that compliment. That that really means a lot to me. And um, so thank you so much. But I think that for anybody listening out there, I think it's really important to understand what it, what imposters are, right? Imposter syndrome is when you are technically capable and, you know, objectively you are skilled. You know what you can do. You know what you're capable of doing and what you can learn. Um, so that's imposter syndrome. Then there's a novice who actually is new, doesn't know anything, knows that they don't know anything. And, you know, that's a novice. And then you have someone who's an actual imposter who knows nothing and then claims that they can do everything. So there are these categories of people. And so when you think about it, imposter syndrome is really someone who's not making the connection uh, emotionally from what they know cognitively. So you know that you can do these things objectively. If I ask you the question, you know, can you do the skill X, Y and Z or could you learn X, Y and Z given your skill base? People who have imposter syndrome would say, you know, if I really think about it rationally, I absolutely can. But there's this emotional disconnect from that. And so you have to figure out what's that about, you know, uh, because it's a vicious cycle and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like if you have imposter syndrome, you'll make safe choices. You don't take chances. Then the outcome's frustrating because you stay small and then it reinforces feelings of inadequacy. And then it goes, aha, see, you're not really all that good. And you watch other people kind of pass you by. So I think that it's really important to be able to emotionally connect with what the log logical truths are about who you are and what your situation is. And I think if there's anything I can pull away is to say, all right, like I kind of getting in touch with those objective truths and start with how you think about yourself. Um, you know, we intervene really hard with thinking. Um, and so we look at where are the moments that you're feeling this? Um, how is this really objectively true? And I think that when you start for your listeners out there, when you start to feel, you know, that, that sense of imposter challenge yourself, I think we allow ourselves to get away with bad thinking and that we always talk about habits as they pertain to like exercising or making your bed, but we don't think about habits in how you think. And so I would say that let's look at how you think when you're thinking it as much as possible and kind of intervene and start to form some new habits there and to challenge yourself on some of the bad habits you may have slipped into. And some of these habits seem innocuous, just like making fun of yourself on maybe on Twitter, you put yourself down like a, um, you'll say it's like a funny joke, putting yourself down or minimizing your contributions. And that stuff is, is not small. And I always tell people, you know, it's that kind of humor, like that kind of uh, in putting yourself down or, or one down humor, that stuff isn't, isn't great for you in the long haul. So be really aware of kind of who you are and how you connect with who you are. Oh, that cut deep. <laughs> I'm thinking back on like my last 10 oh, no. tweets and I'm like, uh, no, but I take so many lessons away from it, right? Like uh, I, I'm constantly iterating on myself and I, you know, I think that, that that's become more of how I operate as a human at this point. And you're absolutely right. The voice that we project ends up being the voice that we believe we are. And 
I have a, an innate ability to put myself down when I shouldn't be, which is something I'm slowly, slowly squeezing out of my brain. But I, I feel that. I feel that on so many levels. I think also, too, I think sometimes as women, we're taught that making others feel uh, comfortable or better is somehow polite. And really, it's, it's not as much politeness as it is kind of putting ourselves as in a one down position is sometimes perceived as weakness. And then that's kind of how we're perceived instead of, you know, we feel great satisfaction sometimes making other people feel comfortable. And there's nothing more making someone more comfortable than sharing a laugh over something that seems pretty innocuous. I just, I have to say, like Dr. Gerner, that resonates with me as well. Sai and I were talking about this because um, we met each other in our 20s. And I, I was talking about us just kind of like flailing our hands around trying to figure out which way was up pretty much, um, but having a good time and laughing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've started to unpack a lot of stuff about ourselves individually that we, you know, we bring to the table and try to celebrate like our, our successes, like wh whatever level they're on and celebrate them. And it feels so weird to try to do that. Um, but starting to unpack some of kind of the, oh God, like when you said, trying to make others feel good. I, I am like a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. I will be like, at least everybody feels good in the room and I can make a joke at my, my own expense and they all laugh and that's okay. But I'm like, no, no, that's not okay. I'm amazing. <laughs> you know, right. and I, you know, I'm amazing. My friends are amazing and I'm okay saying that now, but it took me a long time to get there. Um, so I just, I wanted to just echo basically what you're saying is it's such an individual thing that we have to deal with and recognize to be able to start tuning in to some of those flags. Well, one of the things I love, though, about what you're saying, Megan, is that you've learned to kind of normalize the good stuff. And I think that over time, like surrounding yourself with the right people, surrounding yourself with people who will celebrate those accomplishments, because I think sometimes where we learn some of these bad habits is their ways of compensating when we know that everyone in the room isn't on our side with celebrating those wins or may see our achievements as something to undercut or say a smart remark about. So there's a way of kind of putting the room at ease by, you know, in kind of making a joke at our own expense. So I think it's amazing that you've been able to kind of make that recognition and say, you know, I'm great saying this now, but you're also surrounding yourself with the people who can hear it and who celebrate with you and make you feel good about it. And I think there's something really powerful to that. Thank you. No, it's it's been a long year of introspection and outward help, but um, we're still working on it. We're all a work in progress, you know? So yeah. I get it. I, I don't think we do that enough. Like I think that sometimes if you look at, I use Twitter as an example because it's a place where I'm pretty active, but I'll see sometimes men posting their wins. Like they're like, hey, you know, I just closed on this massive deal. And you see all these guys in the comments, like to their benefit saying like, way to go, man, this is amazing. Like you're incredible. But I don't see a lot of women like posting their wins. Like I want them to though. Like I'm like, where are you ladies? Like tell me about all these great things you're doing, the deals you're closing, the investments you're making. Tell me about those things because I want to cheer you on. Like I want to cheer for you. But we don't talk about those. Instead, we'll put out things more about our relationships or things that are more in other spheres, which are maybe traditionally more acceptable. But the places of power, we still kind of, you know, are around the edges. And I think that it would do all of us a great service if we could just kind of jump in and support each other in those areas too. You know, kind of kind of attached to that idea, Dr. Gerner, I have, so I actually ran into this situation recently, but I was sharing something super important and a huge accomplishment that I had achieved back when I was trading derivatives. And somebody actually told me that I shouldn't be sharing my past experiences. And it was like, it was a male that was like, and I was, what I had done was talked about the fact that I had helped significantly during the financial crisis and I had become an integral part of the team because of what I had done. Um, and he was like, well, why? And I was complaining at the crux of it that one of my biggest gripes was that I didn't always get into the rooms that I wanted to, despite the fact that I had become a significant part of the team. And I didn't allude to gender, race, anything else. That was the only comment that I made. And the comment back to me was, well, you probably made it in when you deserved to get in, not just because you wanted to be in. And I was actually 
I, I didn't know how fully to respond to that because I feel like as a woman, sometimes I get told that I shouldn't be talking about my importance and mm-hmm. it's something that I'm still discovering about myself. But I, I wonder if you have pointers on how we can say things like that without necessarily getting that judgment of which I personally felt was like someone saying kind of arrogantly, like you didn't deserve to be in there until you got in. So what I think is fascinating about that whole dynamic is that it's expected that there will be policing, right? Like he was one of the people policing and making sure that you stayed in your place. Um, and so that's, it's, a, it's a fascinating dynamic to me because I think that policing, especially online, only works because there is no real power in it, right? Like he steps up and he makes this comment. And I think, uh, first of all, I'd probably hide that reply and just like, you know, <laughs> try not to, not to comment on it at all. But um, because it's like an attention like feeder. But at the same time, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I think that responding to it, if you wanted to do so in a public way, is, you know, kind of talking about how interesting it is that sometimes the expert, the expert in the room isn't in the room because of things outside of their expertise. Like you can use it as a teaching moment for others who will not be that person because that person is not going to learn that lesson from any interaction you have. But, and to recognize that this is a a policing moment where people feel that they should tell you how to be or put you in your place. Um, And that this is exactly why saying those things that you did are so important because, you know, the more women are stepping up and saying, this is my experience, the less you can really police it. I mean, if you're an outlier and you're somebody who's out there saying things that are important and challenging and difficult, expect people to want you to be the status quo. And um, so in many ways, that's kind of a signal that you've stepped out of your box. And, and in some ways, that's kind of great. Like it's a it's a high compliment. And I think if if I were to comment and, you know, maybe this is not the correct response, I would say it is a high compliment when someone comes out, you know, to police the rooms, knowing how powerful I am, um, you know, knowing how I much I love and, that. Yeah. You know, like, thank you so much for reading the tweet and for engaging with it and taking the time to respond. Like, I mean, he took time out of his life to police you. It's it's really like an effort he had to make. And so, you know, he did that because there was some response to it and that it, it hit him in a particular way. So I don't know if that's a good way or if it ends up getting some bad responses and others who jump aboard. But I don't know. I'm not always maybe the most PC person. In this <laughs> I'm here for it. Honestly, the, the more powerful a woman, the more she owns her power, the better, frankly. And, and I actually that's making my gears turn. So it's definitely something that's going to be very topical in the near future on my Twitter. feed. Frankly, <laughs> That being said, I have one last question for you, Dr. Gerner. And I think it'll be a theme that a lot of our listeners will be hearing because I am, uh, I'll call it in the midst of figuring out exactly when I want to have a child. I hmm. have had baby fever for a little over a decade. I think my friends are finally sick of hearing it. Like they put their <laughs> plugs in when I talk about it. And, and for me, I think one of the biggest questions, and I don't feel this way, frankly, about HIV. I'm Bradley. They are all very aware of the fact that I would love to be pregnant tomorrow if I could be. But uh, something that I get asked perpetually, especially by friends that are in their 30s that would like to have children is how do you approach that subject with your boss? If you want to have a baby, how do you turn to your boss and say, like, I'm pregnant in a comfortable manner that's not going to cause prejudgment and not going to potentially deteriorate your potential for your career in the future? I think that, you know, when I think about questions like that, I think, as you said, it's really, there's a lot of reliance on the type of employer and the relationship with your employer that you have, and you have a great one. So um, this may not be so much of a factor, but to kind of be able to say, I'm really excited to let you all know that I'm pregnant and this is something that's been really important to me, but to also follow it up with something that will assuage their anxiety with like, so we have a few months And I'm looking forward to prepping the team for our, you know, the transition so that I can be as effective, like so that people can be effective in my absence and be able to take over so that, you know, no balls are dropped and, you know, things are, are kind of in motion during my absence and I'll be ready to pick up the ball when I return. Um, If you plan on returning and that's like the plan that the uh, place that you go. So there's like, I think that it, it has to come. The announcement is not just leaving people in the lurch wondering I mean, you shouldn't even have to think about this, but obviously I think practically you do, is to say, you know, make the announcement, but kind of follow it up with, 
all of the things that you anticipate will be their greatest fear, which is losing you, losing momentum, losing the progress made, and and kind of addressing it from the angle of like, hey, I'm so excited. You all know that I've been like really into this, but you know, now we have a few months and I'm excited to get a good, good processes in place. So, you know, all of these things can happen. So that's how I think about it. I don't know how that sounds or lands with you. I haven't had to go through that situation personally, but how do you, how does that land? I think the biggest thing for me, especially in my last few jobs was that anxiety of sharing initially when something was happening and the reaction that I'd seen my uh, former bosses go through when they heard other women were pregnant for, you know, the second time, sometimes the third, and then c- confusing that honestly with this is the way that it should be versus the way that it should be, which is, you know, proactive bosses that I, like I have now watched my bosses make incredible parental plans, both for men and for women when mm-hmm. they were making their parental or maternity leaves. So, I, I guess it didn't necessarily cross my mind that I could come to the table with a fully thought out plan myself. I think that that would alleviate a lot of the stress on my end, especially because I would then know the transition out. And then I would also have a general understanding of how I'd be able to transition back in. So those are all the, I thought that was super helpful. I guess. Yeah, Megan, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, I love what Dr. Gurner is saying about really own own your own narrative. Like it's the truth and you're owning it. And so don't come in and like sound like you're questioning yourself. You're like, this is it. And I'm excited. And I love working here. And then their reaction is their reaction. And if their reaction is poor, you probably shouldn't be working there in the first place. (laughs) Like maybe it's time to leave. Um, And it's okay to take that, that ownership. And, you know, it's not a risk to me. It's your, it's your life. And work is just a component of it. And you still have to continue down a road because, you know, you're not going to be sitting on your deathbed being like, God, I wish I wouldn't have told them about my maternity leave that way. (laughs) Well, that's true. And I do think that it's important to be able to be excited. I mean, this is it's one of the the biggest markers, you know, of your life if you you choose to become pregnant and can become pregnant. So I, I think that not being able to be excited is it's such a damper on the experience. So I hope that you can genuinely bring that kind of energy to the table. I'm very aware that there's a lot of people who don't feel they can do that uh, because of the environment that they work in or the reception that they know they're going to get. Or as Syra, as you were saying, like seeing it happen with other women and the great opportunity there, if you're in a position of leadership as you are, Syra, is that your experience can really be the the kind of marker so that other women say, wow, she had such a great experience. She was so excited and people were so supportive and she had such a great plan. Like they don't fear that conversation in the future that you kind of set that example for them. And I think there's a real opportunity there as well. I'm actually really excited for a few things we're going to be announcing regarding that in the very near future. So TBD to all the listeners in regard to that, but I am, we are absolutely at HM Bradley, very pro family. And so that's, that's going to be coming out soon. Um, So I'm going to change gears really quickly. We have a lot of questions from our listeners, Dr. Gurner. So I have two in specific that I've been hoping I could ask you if you're ready. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first question is how can I project confidence without becoming unlikable? This is a, it's an interesting question, right? Like how do you do, I think that you have to decide and and kind of know the difference between confidence and arrogance. Uh, Confidence to me is such a likable trait. Like people who are confident to me are people who are just comfortable in their own skin and they own who they are. They're not people, when we think about confidence, we think about an off-putting quality and usually everything we're thinking about that is off-putting and unlikable about confidence is arrogance. You know, confidence engages others, listens to others, you know, feels secure in who they are. All of the things that we see as traits and unlikability around arrogance is that insecurity, the reactionary kind of nature of it, the I'm better than you. um, All of that stuff is is kind of arrogance and insecurity. So to me, confidence is, is probably inherently one of the more likable and attractive qualities that people can have. Uh, because they're totally comfortable in their own skin. So I think that when I I think about that that question, it makes me think that the person asking that question feels uncertain 
about that owning themselves means that they have to be um, an unlikable person by default. And to me, it, that just, it isn't how it feels. If you, if you spend time with someone who's truly confident, I'll use my brother-in-law as an example, because he's, it's a very funny situation. He is a, a, a bodybuilder, um, not it just kind of amateur, but he is a big muscular man. And he is also the father of two daughters, two small girls, and he loves a lot of traditionally feminine interests. So he loves things like gardening. He lo- I'm sure he's going to love me saying this. Hi, Kyle. Um, <laughs> but um, he loves a lot of the things out there that we would associate. Like he's a very, his, he will tear up if an animal is injured. Like he is the most sensitive, wonderful man. But he's completely confident in his own skin. He has traits about him that are masculine and traits about him that are just genuinely him. I don't want to call them feminine because I don't think they are. But you know, he's just comfortable in who he is. And that makes him an inherently complex and likable person. And so I hope that whoever asked this question can just kind of tap in and say, who am I in my own skin? What is genuinely authentically me? And how can I be okay with all of it? Own all of it, be comfortable with all of it. And then people are inherently more comfortable with you. And so for me, that's kind of how I would look at that question. I hope I didn't like beat around the bush too much and get into too much with that. But that's how I think about it. And I'm sure, I guess, if I were to just try to summarize what you said, it's kind of defining your own confidence and then owning it when you walk into a room or when you're entering a conversation with people, which is, again, I think that actually incorporates into some of the imposter syndrome where you just need to kind of find your voice, get comfortable in your voice and in who you are, which honestly has been an evolution for me over the course of my last 30 something years. And I... Yeah, I still think to some extent I'm still discovering exactly who that is, but I simultaneously am much more comfortable in my skin because I, when I sit down and I start talking, I know that what I'm saying is a representation of who I am. That's phenomenal. I mean, I think that's what I hope most people are able to get to and to do. And then I have one other question (laughs) from another listener. And it is, how do you achieve a mindset for healthier living and dieting? Oh, interesting. So I think that uh, healthier living, living and dieting really comes down to identity, right? Like, how do I think about myself? How do I, what value do I place on these particular things and on myself? Um, because we're not going to, it, it's funny, the mind really finds a way to stay consistent with who we believe we are. So for example, if someone comes to me and says, I really struggle with smoking, but I'm a smoker, um, that's gonna be tough, right? I mean, because you've already defined yourself, you are a smoker. Or if you say, you know, I'd love to be healthy, but you know, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm just kind of a slob. Well, you're telling me how you see yourself. You're seeing yourself in a certain way. And so no matter what habits you try to put into place, you have to change that element of your thinking that is defining yourself as a slob. If you can define yourself as a person who's, I'm on my path to getting healthy. I'm a person who's evolving in my journey with my health. I'm somebody who is trying to be a little bit better every day. If somebody says that to me, um, that tells me there's a place in there for this health and wellness. So I think it, it, I always look at what's the layer beneath that that's kind of preventing that from happening. And to me, it starts with how you define yourself and what your identity is. And if you're someone who's working at your health, working at you know your fitness, working at these things, um, then I think you'll stay consistent with that. It's just a matter of seeing like, how do you see yourself? Why does that seem disparate to you or separated from you? Um, and how can you really connect with that as a part of who you are? And that's how I would bring it to the table. Yeah. And, and Dr. Gurner, I know that's our last question, but I just want to follow mm-hmm. up and say, Syra and I talk about this all the time, and I'm sure my coworkers are so sick of me saying this, but I've really found my personal authenticity and I will never compromise that. I like to have fun and I love to wear red lipstick and that's just me. <laughs> you know, I'm I love like, it. It's, it's all over all my white towels. That's fine. My mom isn't happy with me right now because I'm staying with her. But, um, you know, it just is who I am. But it takes a long time to get there. And I think what you're saying is give yourself a little bit of grace and time to find that vulnerability and to find that authenticity. Um, and we can all get there. We just have to be honest with ourselves. 
I think sometimes too, one of the things that I, um, I talked about earlier today, um, I was was talking about it online, but that to think really hard about the person you want to be like in your head, if you can think about who is the person I want to be five years from now and get a, a crystal clear picture as much as you are able to do and to say, like, really see that person, who do I want to be? What does that person like? dress like? What do they look like? Where do they live? What kind of job do they have? What kind of relationships do they have? Are they in touch with themselves spiritually? Do they work out? Do they eat healthy? Do they cook? You know, whatever it is, but get as clear of a picture as you can. And then think about what is the gap really between who I am right now and that person I want to be. And really start to use that as a guide to making the decisions as you move forward. Because I think most people, as we go forward in our lives, we're very unintentional about it. And so it feels like we're just kind of riding in the river of our life, just flowing in a particular Mm -hmm. path. And then five years pass and you're like, what the hell happened? Like, Mm -hmm. where, what is, what's going on? I can't believe I'm already here and I still don't have X, Y, and Z. Whereas if you can figure out where you want to be in five years, you could start filtering your decisions through that. Like, do you take that job? Is that going to get me closer to my future self? Am I going to, you know, take that meeting? Am I going to take that job interview? Am I going to do this particular thing? So you're able to really filter it through this kind of lens and it gives you a little bit more directionality and intention. I think if you can bring yourself to this next phase of your life with intentionality, um, things move a lot more quickly than you think. You'll get places a lot faster and you, you won't be surprised. That resonates so deeply with me. I feel like that was one of the last touches that you and I had in, in our coaching sessions was in order for me to enable myself to find my own voice, I really had to envision who that person was. And I think that's probably one of the more transformative things for me as I continue to evolve as a human. So I, I actually think that's the perfect place to finish here. Um, Dr. Gurner, I would love for our audience members to be able to find you. So where should they be looking online uh, in order to get in touch with you? Sure. I mean, you can find me. I'm usually very responsive on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Gurner. Um, and feel free to start a conversation, comment. Um, I try to be pretty interactive on that platform. So feel free. You can also, if you're interested in coaching services or working with yourself or your business, you can find me at drgurner.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Gurner. This has been great. I am so excited to share this episode with our listeners. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to reconnect and great to meet you, Megan. Great to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Meg, I'm a little bit speechless. I have no words, even though I'm talking for how <laughs> absolutely amazing that was. Um, God, I can't believe you got to work with her. Now I'm like, all right, Dr. G is a G and I like want to work with her too. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody does, but um, God, what a presence and the way that she thinks and is so thoughtful through some of the questions that we asked her was just unbelievable. Um, I, yeah, it gives me the, I don't know if it gives you the feeling, but it definitely gives me the feeling that she's done this a few times before. She's yeah. definitely heard a lot of these questions and she's helped people solve these problems. She's certainly helped me solve these problems. I don't know if anyone can tell by the way, but I was an imposter syndrome filled being for ever pretty much until I met her and still to this day I battle that but I think it has been minimized to one part of my soul then rampantly spreading across my body and having me continuously be anxious that I'm going to get fired every single day of my life I don't know if you've ever felt that way before of course I have I think a lot of people and feel that way Sai men and women and I think it's something I think looking at you and your confidence and knowing you and your presence, people were, are going to be like, wait, 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 she feels that way too? Oh, I'm allowed to feel this way. I'm not crazy. A lot of people do feel this way. Um, but also just some nuggets. So, you know, I took some notes. Um, all right. First and foremost, we all need to own the narrative of every aspect of our life. Yes. Right. Love that. Yes. Own the narrative. Speak it with confidence. Be confident, not arrogant. Yes. And I think if I were to add on to that, it's envisioning yourself as the powerful person that you are and enacting it, right? So for me, that's I am a strong female leader in this industry and I have a very loud voice 
and I'm going to project my opinions and I'm going to make sure that the way that I project my opinions is not only inclusive, but it's thoughtful. So that's, and that's part of whom I've become over time. And then such a poignant part was be confident, not arrogant. You know, I was like, yes, it's okay to be confident. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, it's it's okay to talk about your wins. I thought that that was so wonderful that she said that. I continuously felt like I could never talk about the fact that I was extremely successful. I still am extremely successful. I continue to bring other people in that I consider to be extremely successful. We should all be able to share in each other's wins. Something that I think pisses off the both of us is that a lot of women celebrate the events like getting married and having kids. But I also would love to celebrate when I get a promotion or when I change to a really cool job. I mean, celebrate me for who I am rather than for achievements that are very specific and pigeonholed and don't necessarily fit somebody else's narrative. Like I want to fit in like a, I want to fit in my narrative and own that. And B, I want other people to be able to understand that there's so much more to life than just the family side or just the work side. There's a combination of both that affect us all and that we should be celebrating every single stage of our lives together rather than only celebrating the ones that seem to fit into a very specific stereotype. Absolutely. And being each other's cheer- cheerleaders as women, I mean, that is so, so important. I know to both of us in our relationship, like you have a win, like I'm right behind you with like fireworks. You know what I mean? Yes. And vice yes. versa. And we need to continue to do that for each other and just pump each other up. I'll pump yes. you up. And be proud of all of the things that we accomplish, whether it's a really cool promotion mm-hmm. or whether it's getting married or whatever the case may be. So I love you, Meg. I'm just, I'm kind of elated and I feel like I want to take this high and like go do something exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go do it. Let's rock this pasta party. I love you too. Right. Yay. I'll talk to you soon, babe. Love All you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.